Thank you for the pre for the opportunity to give the presentation about the feed guidelines. And um, as you know, it's from a technical advisory group, and it has been a group work. And I especially would like to thank uh, the other partners in the technical advisory groups, especially the people from Africa, Asia, and Latin America, um, giving very essential information to um, develop guidelines that are uh, can be used for, for a wider range of feed uh, production and supply chains. This is the team of uh, the technical advisory group, uh, the people that um, gave uh, contributions uh, to the meetings. And I already see that I forgot uh, someone, Professor Dong Hong Min, who is in the audience, should also be on the list. So sorry for that, that I forgot you, but you belong to the list as well, indeed. OK, well, what did we do? Um, we knew that this was not the first time that people looked at the, uh, at the feed supply chain. So we said we have to build on existing met methodologies and standards and on practitioner experience, so not reinvent the wheel. And um, we did a literature review. We have checked uh, what was available. And uh, that has been used in this process. And at the same moment, um, we had to deal with a very wide variation um, of uh, production supply chains, free supply chains. Um, so we developed a flexible and uh, modular approach so that we are able to deal with that variation. I will come back to that later. And we also said, OK, you need flexibility, but we try to be as prescriptive as possible, but only in those places where indeed you can be prescriptive. And we also have some contentious areas where we give recommendations, but also say that other options should be explored. In a life cycle assessment, you have to go to uh, goal and scope definition first. And in part, they also um, affect the system boundaries, reference flow, and allocation, etc., cetera, in, um, in the further uh, process. But Irrespective of the goal and scope, we came up with uh, some predefined uh, boundaries, flows, etc. And I will discuss them to, uh, to show what they are. Because the goal and scope is also um, in this feed supply chain. It's not only coming from uh, this, uh, the ana feed analysis itself. It's often linked to the life uh, livestock supply chain that you're analyzing. So it can come from the poultry chain. It can come from uh, the small ruminants chain. And then that defines also what you have to do in the feed supply chain. But for our analysis, um, we define the system boundary as the cradle to the animal's mouth. So in fact, everything that belongs to feed production, processing, transport, and preparation of the animal's ration. And to deal with the variation, we came up with a set of internal system boundaries, which allow you to skip a part of the whole supply chain. And I already mentioned the modular approach. We uh, distinguished four modules, four stages. Feed production, it can be plant production, but it can also be uh, from animal production. Processing, feed compounding, and feed preparation at the farm. And between those four modules, there is always, uh, in one form or another, transport and trade. It's the link between the different stages. And that can be a complex uh, link. That can be a very simple link. Here we speak about the reference flow and not about uh, the functional unit, because it is um, the end product of the feed supply chain is something to be used in livestock production systems. So and there, the functional unit is defined. But the reference flow for all products that we use is one kilogram of feed material as is. So as a fresh product or while well, containing a certain amount of moisture. But there is attributional information attached to this uh, one kilogram of feed material. It's a dry matter content, and it's gross energy, but also a list of predefined feed characteristics that are suitable for ruminants, pigs, and poultry so that all feed materials, when they are synthesized to an animal's ration, 
that you also can do your calculations with a nutritional model. And we define the list so that it's so that it's also possible to do uh, rather detailed calculations and uh, with sophisticated nutritional models. Allocation. Well, as mentioned before, indeed uh, an endless discussion. Um, here we stick strictly to the ISO rules because we say, okay, when it's possible, avoid it. If not, well, see if you can solve this by six system expansion or by substitution. And if you cannot avoid allocation, you have to go to allocation on the basis of physical properties. And if that's not possible, well, go to other relationships. And in the feed sector, we took the economic allocation as a preferred option. Not coming from the idea that this should be the one, but based on the complex situation that feed is valued for multiple functions. It's for energy, for protein, for other nutrients, uh, but sometimes also for anti-nutritional factors. And uh, these various physical properties cannot be captured in one physical model yet. It would be very interesting to develop such a model, but that's not available. So at this moment, we say that the price is a good reflection of the um, complex of this of this complex set of physical properties. But to show the effect of allocation, because it can have a clear effect, alternative allocation options uh, for comparison um, shall also be applied. On the one hand, our experience in uh, some mitigation projects that we are running now, that is that once the allocation has been defined, the word allocation is never coming back in the discussion anymore because then it's about improvement of the supply chains. Well, after you have uh, defined your system boundaries, etc., in fact, it's on top of this graph, and you have two options, whether the feed chain is part of a livestock system, yes, then the goal and scope come from that livestock system, and otherwise you have to define it yourself. Um, after you check, again, the system boundaries, your allocation method, etc., then you have to uh, define all the feed components and the fractions of those components in the animal's rations. Those are all the feed components that you have to analyze. And per feed component, you have to define the relevant stages of the complete supply chain. So in some cases, that's only the cultivation stage. In others, it's a combination of cultivation, processing, compound feed production, and at the farm. But in fact, the cultivation stage which is the feed production stage, and the farm should always be in it. And as a link uh, between those stages, you have transport and trade. So this green box uh, that you see here in this picture is in fact uh, repeated for all feed components. At the end, all data per feed component uh, are combined and a weighted average are made. And this information can be considered as a final result if you do only a feed chain analysis, but if you do a livestock system analysis, then it goes to the livestock system and will be used as an input in that analysis. This green box is um, broken down in this picture, where in fact we say the first step is indeed collect all data on inputs and resource use, etc. And everything that is related to the production or to the processing, etc should be collected. Based on the collected information, emissions and resource use can be calculated as totals. And then the third step is that some of the inputs um, are used for more than one production unit or for more than one production cycle when it comes to, feed, to crop production. Then these have to be allocated to one production unit or to one production cycle. And after that, the next then is a second allocation step, which is in step four. There you have to allocate all these inputs that are at the unit level, and you have to allocate them to the co-products within that production unit. And then the final result is the emissions per kg of co-product. 
here you find an example of uh, the variation in a chain and this is even within one product this is cassava production in Western Africa and um, there we have uh, distinguished now three chains for example the short chain where you have cultivation of cassava it's um, harvested at the farm processed at the farm uh, fresh roots mainly go to food partly go to feed but all the cassava leaves and also the peels they go to the feed well you have sometimes a little bit longer chain than cassava is well indeed cultivated but then processed at a very local basis and there in a very small uh, processing plant it's uh, peeled and chipped and the dry cassava peels um, they are used as animal feed and you see there that the transport is in between well that sometimes it's 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 a very simple transport this can be done well in fact by carrying it uh, by hand or on your back uh, this can be on a wheelbarrow this can be on a bike everything well in the long chain you see that the cultivation of cassava then it goes to a large uh, factory and this is S1 where the cassava roots are processed in the Gary plant and then second uh, processing step where the cassava peels and polish are processed and they end up as animal feed um, and there often transport and trade uh, will be much longer also other different types of transport will be used so the uh, modular approach yeah. I'm running yeah, out of time. Excuse me, Tern. Tern, uh, Tern. Sorry, Tern. Uh, sorry to, um, yeah, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt. If you could just um, say a couple of words about um, yeah. land use okay. change, we, we do need um, to. Good. Um, regarding the land use change, that was also a contentious uh, issue. Um, what you see in, in literature, that there is not a consistent methodology, there is a large variation and it's often a combination of a scientific and a policy or political approach and one important thing that what bluntly spoken when the forest is cut you hardly can manage anything at farm level anymore um, but we say okay it shall be assessed but it has to be reported separately um, and the main reason is that we want to not, it's, it should be there or it has to be there because it's important and we have to create insight in the importance and in the wide range of different methods and we suggested two methods uh, uh, to be compa compared giving an impression of the wide range of land use change emissions and you can add a third method if you want but the main goal of this is about understanding how does land use change affect the carbon footprint of product and it's not about the blame game and when you discuss um, land use change indeed uh, on different continents you see that indeed it's a very sensitive uh, subject 